Hi everybody, this is Rishi Agarwal, and in this video we're going to be talking about the lymph node stations in the chest. Now before we get into this, I would like for you to review two things. One is the IASLC nodal chart, this is the 8th edition, and there's two pages to this. One is the pictures of each lymph node station, but the second is the nodal definition, so it describes the borders of each lymph node station in detail. The second thing that I think you should review is this radiographics article from 2014. It goes over the IASLC lymph node map and it goes over some of the nuances of each station. Okay, let's get into this. So the first station are the low cervical, supraclavicular, and sternal notch lymph nodes. These are considered uh, station one. And the superior border of these is the bottom of the cricoid cartilage, which this is the cricoid cartilage right here. So right here is where I would be looking for lymph nodes, right next to the thyroid gland, the carotid arteries, and anterior to the scalene muscles. And the inferior border of this is in the midline, the top of the manubrium, and laterally it's the clavicles. So for example, this lymph node right here would be a right supraclavicular lymph node. And these are designated right and left by the midline of the trachea. So if we bisect the trachea in half, everything to the right is considered 1R and everything to the left is considered 1L. It's really important to distinguish between supraclavicular lymph nodes and upper paratracheal nodes because an upper paratracheal node can be an N2 node by TNM staging, whereas a supraclavicular node is automatically N3. So how do you tell the difference between a supraclavicular node and an upper paratracheal node? So if we look at the IASLC nodal definitions, the upper border of the upper paratracheal nodes are the apex of the lung and pleural space, and in the midline, the upper border of the manubrium. So in this example, this would be a upper paratracheal node because it's below the apex of the lung here. Okay. Another way to look at it is by looking at the plane that's made by the first rib. So if I scroll over here on the sagittal images, the first rib is slanted like this. Okay, So everything above the first rib would be a supraclavicular, whereas below the first rib would be an upper paratracheal. Okay. So all, I would, all I'd have to do is follow this plane over and see that this lymph node is below that line. Now in the midline, the border is the superior aspect of the manubrium. So if I scroll down, this lymph node right here, this lymph node right here, these are both supraclavicular lymph nodes because they're above the manubrium. Whereas this lymph node right here would be considered a prevascular node and not a supraclavicular node because we're below the top of the manubrium. So the inferior border of the upper paratracheal nodes differs from left to right. Okay, On the left, it's the top of the aortic arch, and on the right, it's the bottom of the left innominate vein. Okay, For all intents and purposes, those are really at the same level. So really, I just look at the top of the aortic arch. Okay, If it's below the top of the aortic arch, then that's a lower paratracheal node, like this would be a lower paratracheal node. And if it's above the top of the aortic arch, then that would be considered an upper paratracheal node. Now there are some nodes that might cross that border and go from upper to lower. So what you have to do is use your coronal and sagittal images if this question ever arises and try to determine where the bulk of the node sits. Is it above the top of the aortic arch and that would make it a 2 or is it below the top of the aortic arch and that would make it a 4. One important point to keep in mind about the paratracheal lymph nodes is that the dividing line between the right and left paratracheal nodes is not the midline, it's actually the left lateral border of the trachea. So the paratracheal nodes that are to the left of this are considered left paratracheal and nodes that are to the right and anterior to the trachea are considered right paratracheal. Okay, So this node right here is considered a right paratracheal. 
The reason why this is important is because if you had a lung cancer on this side, this lymph node would be considered an ipsilateral mediastinal node, whereas if you had a lung cancer on the other side, this lymph node would be considered a contralateral mediastinal node. The right and left hilar lymph nodes, 10R and 10L, are immediately inferior and lateral to the paratracheal nodes, and they're defined by the presence of the right and left mainstem bronchi. Okay, so as long as you still have trachea and carina, that's still considered paratracheal nodes. Now, once the carina has split into two, and you have a right and left mainstem bronchi, then you can call this a 10L and this a 10R. Now, in addition to the lower paratracheal nodes, the carina represents the inferior extent of the level 3A nodes, or the prevascular nodes. So these are nodes that I consider to be in the anterior mediastinum, with the anterior border being the sternum, and the posterior border being the great vessels and the SVC. Now, things get a little bit trickier as you go superiorly, because these lymph nodes to the left and anterior to the aortic arch are not considered to be prevascular nodes. These are paraaortic nodes, so these are level 6. Okay, so all of these nodes here would be 3A, and these are level 6 paraaortic nodes. The retrotracheal lymph nodes are designated 3P, and these are the ones that are located immediately posterior to the trachea. And usually they're on the right side, like in this case, because on the left side posterior to the trachea is where the esophagus lifts. The superior border of this space is the apex of the chest and the inferior border is the carina, although usually these will be above the level of the aortic arch, as in this case. I want to talk about the subaortic and the paraaortic nodes next, and to do that I want to pull up the coronal images. So I mentioned that the paraaortic nodes are the ones that are anterior and lateral to the aortic arch, and it helps to see that on the coronal images. So these are the lymph nodes right here. These are considered paraaortic lymph nodes. Now just underneath that, where the aortic arch stops, is where the subaortic lymph nodes begin. Okay, and these are station 5, also called the aortopulmonary window lymph nodes. Okay, so these are considered station 6 paraaortic nodes because they're at the level of the aortic arch, but below the level of the aortic arch, these here are considered station 5, subaortic or aortopulmonary. Okay, so these are 6 and these are 5. Station 7 is the subcarinal lymph node station, and as the name implies, it's inferior to the carina, so right here. And on the axials, that would be this lymph node right here. And the inferior extent of the subcarinal region on the right is where the bronchus intermedius ends. So when you see the right middle lobe and lower lobe taking off, then that's where the subcarinal region ends on the right. And on the left, it's where the left lower lobe bronchus starts. So this is left upper lobe, and this is left lower lobe right here. So this is the inferior extent of the subcarinal region on the left. Just inferior to that are the parasophageal nodes. So these are the nodes immediately adjacent to the esophagus. And these extend from the inferior aspect of the subcarinal region all the way down to the level of the diaphragm. Those are the parasophageal nodes, station 8. The next station is station 9, pulmonary ligament nodes. So the pulmonary ligament is just a medial reflection of the parietal pleura, and it extends down inferiorly from the level of the uh, pulmonary vein. So this is the left inferior pulmonary vein, and this is the right inferior pulmonary vein. If you look right here, there's a little soft tissue. That's a little lymph node in the left inferior pulmonary ligament. So that would be a station 9L lymph node. The upper border of these lymph nodes are the inferior pulmonary veins on both the left and the right, and the lower border is the diaphragm. The next lymph node station is number 11, the interlobar nodes. And on the right, you have two stations here, the 11S for superior and the 11I for inferior. 
The 11S is the lymph node that is right between the right upper lobe bronchus and the bronchus intermedius. So on the axials, that would be this node right here. And the 11I, the inferior node, would be the one between the right middle lobe bronchus and the right lower lobe bronchus. So that would be this one right here. So let's scroll to it. That would be that node right there. And on the left side, the lymph node between the left upper lobe bronchus and the left lower lobe bronchus. So that would be this one right here. And on the coronals, it's this lymph node right here. Now the IASLC does not really give us any more detail about the lymph nodes further out, except to say that station 12, the lobar nodes, are adjacent to the lobar bronchi, 13, the segmental nodes are adjacent to the segmental bronchi, and 14, the subsegmental nodes are adjacent to the subsegmental bronchi. So you can define these nodes, but it's important that you know the segmental anatomy in order to properly define them. Now there are some lymph nodes that are not defined by the IASLC, and let me just make this a little bit smaller here. And in all of these four areas, if you see enlarged lymph nodes, it's important to look for evidence of pleural metastatic disease if we're talking about lung cancer, although it's possible to have them enlarged in the absence of pleural disease as well. So these areas are the internal mammary region, right next to the artery and vein, the intercostal region, right next to the vertebral body, anterior to the diaphragm, so anterior diaphragmatic nodes, and mid-diaphragmatic nodes, so mid-diaphragmatic nodes would be adjacent to the IVC here. And in these two groups, the mid-diaphragmatic nodes, the ones adjacent to the IVC and the ones anterior to the diaphragm, these are also commonly enlarged in patients who have liver cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Okay, that's it. If anybody has questions about the topics covered today, please leave a comment below.